Hello, uh, it's good to have you here, and I have uh, at least three main comments I would like to make in response to the excellent presentation that uh, Dr. Juan Martinez did. And as you know, well, Latin America is too broad, and there are many issues to cover. I think the, the essential one that we all need to understand is the importance of Roman Catholicism uh, in Latin America. Uh, just to give you again a little bit of background, uh, when Columbus discovered America in 1492. Uh, that same year, uh, the kings of Spain, uh, Isabel and Fernando, who got married, united the kingdom, they also were able to expel the Jews and the Muslims from Spain and also to unite the country. Uh, now, when any country takes control of the, con of the other region, or governors take control of the uh, region, they do two things. They impose the language. So Castilian cast became Spanish, so it's the same, Castil Castilian or Spanish are the same. But also, these two kings, Isabel and Fernando, were known as the Catholic kings. So Catholicism became the official religion of the kingdom. Therefore, that became the official religion in Latin America. As a matter of fact, the, the Pope, Alexander VI, in 1493, he awarded the new territories to uh, Spain and Portugal under two conditions. One, that uh, Everything, all regions will belong also to the Catholic state, will be Catholic countries, and the people will be instructed in the Catholic faith. So for, since the very beginning, Roman Catholicism became the state religion. And interestingly, uh, just as a case of Mexico, Martin Luther and Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conquistador, they were contemporary historical figures. So Martin Luther was born in 1483, Hernán Cortés, the one who conquered the new Spain, or all from the middle of the United States to Central America, he was born in 1485. Uh, Luther died in 1546. Cortés died in 1547. The conquest of Mexico began in 1519, and 1517, that's when Luther nailed his 95 Thesis uh, on the door of Wittenberg on October 31st. Um, the final uh, conquest, of, conquest of Mexico ended in 1521, and that's in 1521 where Luther defended his faith against uh, Charles V. So as you can see, even the Refor when the Reformation was growing in Europe, Spain was conquering Latin America or, and Portugal, and then they were under Catholicism for more than three centuries. Uh, Catholicism was official religion. Uh, another important background, Charles V also was the king of uh, Germany. When he moved to Spain, also the king of Spain, Charles, the first of Germany, the fifth of Spain, he, des he decided he will not uh, face the same situation he was facing in, in Germany and many other countries in Europe. So he installed or established the Inquisition with, with the purpose of uh, rejecting, keeping away, and killing Lutherans or Protestants. And that's the, that's the case where... Uh, for centuries to be a Latin America, to be an Spaniard, that meant to be a Roman Catholic. It was illegal to be a Lutheran. Uh, I'm tempted to continue telling you a little bit about the Spanish Reformation. That's one of my passions, but I will uh, stop here. Otherwise, I would use all my time dealing with that. But that explains why to this day, Spain is one of the countries with the less Protestant or evangelical presence in the world, less than 1% of the population. And for example, in Mexico, uh, the separation of church and state didn't happen until 1857. So before 1857, it was illegal, it was against the law not to be a Catholic. And that was the same case in, in all uh, Latin America. So Protestantism is fairly new, but it has been growing, exploding, and the presence and power of the Roman Catholic Church has been diminishing. So they are still the majority. Uh, to be a Catholic is part of the culture, but uh, the Protestant faith is growing. And interestingly, when one becomes an evangelical, when one accepts the free gift of salvation, uh, it's very common for us to say, I became a Christian. So in my case, I was born and raised Roman Catholic, and when I was 11 years old, I, I became a Christian. I accepted the gift of 
uh, Salvation of Christ, uh, the Vacation Bible School. And even Catholics use that term. So in, in North America, some people have a struggle to say, well, Catholics and Christians, are, I, I thought they were the same. Catholicism is just another denomination. Well, not such, that's not the way it's perceived in Latin America and in Spain. You, you are a Christian, that means you are a Protestant or Evangelical, and you are a Catholic. And the main issue is the, the issue of salvation, soteriology, which uh, for me and for many people is a key one. It's, the, it's an essential one. Uh, so the presence of Roman Catholicism is diminishing, and yet it still is part of the culture. Another important thing is that uh, the terms Protestant and Evangelical are synonyms. In our context here in North America, many people refer to Protestants as more mainline groups and Evangelicals, uh, Protestant with a certain flavor. In Latin America, those terms are just synonyms. Evangelicals, Protestants, they are the same. Uh, well, so that, that, that's one thing, uh, the presence of Roman Catholicism. Just the last comment I want to make there is, when my father became a believer, um, first generation uh, Christian, he grew, he grew up in a very strong Roman Catholic family. His bro older brother is a priest. Uh, my father went to Catholic seminaries. He worked as an accountant for almost 30, year, uh, 30 years at the main Catholic offices in my hometown, Guadalajara, Mexico. Well, when he started attending an evangelical church and he became a believer, he became the black sheep of his family along with his mom. He was rejected, expelled, excommunicated, he lost his inheritance. His own mother st started calling him the donkey. She said, well, or the animal, because only in the, through the church there is salvation. If you leave the Catholic Church, well, what is the difference between you and a donkey? You're just like an animal. Uh, he was fired from his job. He lost his retirement. He was almost only two years, uh, two years shy of retirement, and he lost everything. Uh, my dad passed away four years ago, and I, at the funeral, my uncle, the priest, he even showed up at the funeral, and even another, at that place, he went where the body was, and he told, and he told him, he, I was next to him, and he said, I still cannot believe how you became a Protestant. You, are, you were raised well, uh, so you brought shame to the family. That's a, a still very part of, uh, of our culture. Uh, in my case, only my Two brothers and my mom will be Protestants. The rest of my family are Roman Catholics. And my wife is the only non-Roman Catholic in her family. Uh, so that's a sharp distinction between of, sal of the issue of salvation. <clears throat> the other important point that uh, you see, I want to stress is the issue of poverty and how religion or faith, Christianity, relates to poverty. I, I remember one once here uh, Samuel Escobar, which is a very important Latin American theologian, uh, talking about hermeneutics. And, and he said that he always used to ask people in, in the audience when he's teaching how to study the Bible, what did Jesus mean when he said, the poor you will always have with you? And of course, that, that's in the context of, uh, of a story in, 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 in the Gospels. But most of the time, everybody hears that word and says, well, that means there's always poor and you have to help the poor, and well, uh, we need to do our best, but poverty is an issue of life. Uh, but one day, there was an old lady who was in the class, and she answered, well, that means that there will always be oppressors that will make us poor. And the point is, you see that passage with different lenses if you are poor or if you are the not poor. And many times we approach the issue of poverty as if we are not the poor. And yeah, those, yeah, those people, poor people. But if you are the poor, you see the faith in a different, with a different way. And that's what is happening in Latin America. It was a poor nation, poor region, uh, I'm sorry. And then we have the, received the gospel mainly for North America and with a huge emphasis on salvation, on the future, and yet without a connection to daily life. They are not addressing the issues of daily life more many evangelicals. So in the last 50 years, a, a, a lot of theologians have been dealing with, well, how does our faith relate to poverty? And that's where uh, liberation theology became really important, one aspect. Uh, not every 
not everybody who is concerned about the poor or is concerned about how or faith relates to daily life issues is related to liberation theology or communism. That's another thing. Here in this country, in, in America, we hear capitalism, communism, black or white, no middle ground. Uh, for many people, they say, well, I'm not a communist. I'm not necessarily a capitalist. Is there another option? Or faith can deal with our issues of daily life. Uh, so you could be what in our context could be an oxymoron. You can be a, a conservative, theologically evangelical, and a very liberal, socially speaking, or with a liberal agenda. You know, here is either you are one or the other. In that, in our context in Latin America, that's not the case. Most people will be considered very liberal, uh, socially speaking, in terms of addressing the needs of uh, daily life, poverty, injustice, and yet very conservative uh, theologically. And I think that's uh, an important aspect that many of the Latin American theologians are uh, trying to address. So liberation theology as a movement is from the past. It was related to certain uh, agenda, and it obviously influenced by communism or Marxism. But that concern is, remains, uh, not because we uh, are concerned about these issues. That means we are necessarily aligning with liberation theology. Uh, so this is the issue. How does our faith relate to our daily life and in this presence? And um, finally, uh, and it was mentioned uh, very well by uh, Dr. Martinez, Pentecostalism is the great largest evangelical movement, not only in Latin America, but in the world. And uh, There are many reasons. One of them, I think, is because they, it's a movement from lay people that relates to everybody else, to everybody, and also because they are addressing this issue of poverty. They connect with the masses, connect with the people. Uh, with experience. I remember being in Cuba, for example, several times, and I, some churches were vibrant in their worship, relating to uh, the community, singing uh, hymns or songs with autochthonous instruments, kind of a salsa rhythm. I mean, in another church, not far from that church, when they were, uh, everybody was dressed with coat and tie, and singing hymns in the piano, and even though it was uh, July in Cuba, so extremely hot, but I were just imported the uh, model from the 50s here in, in the United States. So Pentecostalism is relating to everybody else, the people, uh, to the masses, and that's why it's one of the reasons it's growing. Unfortunately, one of the weaknesses of that is that they reach everybody, and even though they affirm their uh, belief in the Bible, in the authority of the scriptures, the knowledge of the scriptures is very weak. Uh, so that's also a need uh, from that. I would like to uh, just draw to attention, if you are interested, uh, to a couple of issues. One is the, the Journal of Christian Education. If you Google Christian Education Journal, on the main website, you will see a link to this issue. It's called uh, International Perspectives on Christian Education. And it's free, you can download it. And there's a section on Latin America that a colleague uh, from here at Talbot Viola and I we were the editors. And I have an article on the right the importance of Pentecostalism in Latin America. You could read that. And also in the current issue just came out last week of the same journal, Christian Education Journal. I I, I wrote an article about the Spanish Reformation. So as I was talking about the importance of the Spanish Reformation. The last point related to that, in, t before I close, is there were believers in Spain who got converted by, the, by studying the scriptures without foreign inference. Just like Luther was studying the Bible and he read Romans and he said, well, salvation is by faith, by grace, through faith in Christ. The same thing happened in Spain with several people. Two of those uh, are very well known. Casero de Reina and Cipriano de Valera, two year old monks who uh, one translated the Bible into Spanish, the other one revised it, and that's why we have the Reina Valera. So that's, this is important because people in Spain think that Christianity or uh, Protestantism is foreign. In Latin America, some people think, well, Protestantism is an American religion. Well, that's not true. They were believers 
in Spain who became to saving faith in Christ to the study of the scriptures. So I think that that's an, an important aspect to mention. Well, thank you for your time and God, God's presence in everything you do. And if I can be of any help, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Presence.